Hello and welcome to an India Today special broadcast on day 50 of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. I'm Gaurav Savant. There is serious escalation with Ukraine firing two Neptune anti-ship missiles at the Russian guided missile cruiser Moskova seriously damaging the ship and Russia threatening to strike Kyiv. The pride of the Russian naval fleet. Six hundred and eleven foot long, carries over five hundred fighters. Moscow, Russia's most critical warship. Ukraine claims to have crippled Moscow. Kyiv's Neptune missile hits Russian warship. Moscow admits warship seriously damaged. Biggest win for Kyiv since the war began. Moscow sunk in Black Sea. Big focus on India first. Moscow is a 12,500-ton displacement flagship of the Black Sea fleet of the Russian Navy. This is one of the most potent weapon platforms that the Russian Navy has. It's the flagship. It has the S-300 anti-missile defense system. It has the most powerful anti-aircraft, anti-ship and anti-submarine warfare equipment. It has helicopters on board and the Ukraine forces fired two Neptune anti-ship missiles off the coast of Odessa. Now, this is how they've destroyed perhaps the most potent weapon platform in the Black Sea fleet. In the past, they've also damaged a landing ship. They've sent out a very strong signal to Russia and Russia clearly will now hit back and hard. We bring you our top story. The pride of the Russian Navy in the Black Sea off Ukraine's southern coast. 13,000 tons of pure weaponry. Nearly 200 meters long. And with 500 warrior sailors on board. But the formidable guided missile cruiser you see in these images may be a thing of the past. Because the Moskva has in all likelihood been destroyed. It started with the Russian Ministry of Defense revealing that a massive onboard fire had dealt extensive damage to this warship. With reports revealing that the entire crew of the Russian flagship had been evacuated from the vessel as onboard ammunition exploded in the blaze. But Russia's claim that the ship was damaged in an accident have been pushed back hard by Ukraine, which claims that the vessel was struck by Ukrainian Neptune cruise missiles fired from the Odessa region. Oleksiy Arestovich, an advisor to the Ukrainian president, also quipped in an interview today that he was aware of the fire but did not specifically know the cause, joking that maybe some Russian soldiers had been smoking where they shouldn't have been. Здесь, ну, мы всегда к этому готовы, пусть, пусть летит, посмотрим. Надо просто помнить, что на любой выстрел по нашим органам управления у нас найдется... On day 50 of this conflict, Ukraine has scored a major hit. This cruiser was armed with anti-ship, anti-submarine and surface-to-air missiles. And this is an indication that despite 50 days of conflict, Russia hasn't been able to neutralize all the surface-to-air missiles and anti-ship missiles. And this is exactly what Ukraine's President Zelensky has been seeking. Anti-ship missiles, surface-to-air missiles, longer-range missiles to take on the Russian forces along with fighter jets and T-72 tanks.
Baryakhtar drone was flown over the Black Sea to distract the Moskva warship and divert its attention while Ukrainian cruise missile units mounted their secret attack on the warship. This claim too cannot be confirmed, though Russia did release footage just two days ago of another of its Black Sea fleet ships appearing to shoot down what they claim is a combat drone from the Ukrainian side. A fourth possibility being considered is that the ship ran into a bed of Ukrainian sea mines and exploded on contact. As this war of claims and counterclaims continues, what is undeniable is that Russia's most formidable warship in the Black Sea has been stricken and evacuated. Whether it continues to float or has been sunk has not been confirmed either. But the Moskva, a ship named after Russia's beloved capital, will no longer be a weapon of war in this fight. And that's a big blow no matter which way you look at it. With Gaurav Savant in Dnipro, Ukraine, Bureau Report, India Today. Russia has now threatened to hit the command centers of the Ukraine army here in Kiev. And this is a serious escalation given the fact that both the forces have been at each other's throats for the past 50 days. Ukraine on its part is now demanding more S-300 missile defense systems and fighter jets to be able to hit back at the Russian forces. Ukraine's armed forces and the president of this country, President Zelensky, they insist they have the potential to strike harder and protect not just their country, but even Europe. Russia, of course, has threatened to hit harder. This is what day 50 of the Russian invasion of Ukraine looked like. Kharkiv, the eastern city of Ukraine, came under heavy shelling, causing multiple casualties, including a child. With talks between the two countries deadlocked, Russia has stepped up its offensive and issued a fresh and dire warning. The Russian Defense Ministry says that Ukrainian forces are attempting to sabotage and strike Russian territory. And now Moscow has threatened to target command centers in Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, if Ukrainian troops continue to attack Russian territory. For 50 days now, Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, has successfully resisted the Russian onslaught. It has pushed back the Russian forces, even as its suburbs have come under relentless attack. Moscow's warning of imminent attacks on decision-making centers in Kyiv is only latest in a series of threats. One thing is clear, Kyiv will continue to fight back. But the Russian onslaught continues. After 50 days of war, most cities of Ukraine, for most part, have been reduced to rubble. From Kyiv suburbs to the eastern city of Kharkiv, Mariupol to Chernihiv in the north. The cities have been ravaged by Russian shelling and rocket attacks. Ukraine claims Russian shelling has left more than 10,000 civilians dead and counting. Seven weeks after the Russian invasion began, this is the current state of play. Putin has already declared that he won't stop till all his noble goals are achieved. He set his eyes on Kyiv now. There's only one thing to look out for another massive escalation. With Rajesh Pavar in Kyiv, Ukraine, you're a report India Today. And after increasing their hold on Mariupol, the Russian forces are now advancing forward. India Today's foreign affairs editor Geeta Mohan travelled with the Russian forces. She's now in the Zaporozhia province or the Zaporozhia Oblast as it's called. She travelled to Melitopol. Now these are newer areas that Russian armed forces are taking in their control and they're not far from the Zaporozhia nuclear power plant. What's the signal here? They not only want to control territory, they also want to control nuclear power supply to Ukraine and that will be a very strong weapon in their hands when it comes to further and future negotiations. Geeta Mohan with this report. Zaporizhia is a city in southeastern Ukraine on the banks of the Dnieper River. As per 2021, the city had a population of 7,22,713. 
It's also the site of Ukraine's largest nuclear power plant, now captured by Russian forces. Zaprisia Oblast, or the district, is known for its heavy industrial region. With the Russian invasion, the city and district wears the look of a war zone. A critical area, a very important region for uh, the Russian forces as also for Ukraine, uh, because this again is on the shores of the Sea of Azov. So a very important uh, and critical uh, province or region for Ukraine. In the first week of March, Russian troops entered Zaprisia. The fears mounted when on 4th March, Ukraine announced that one of the reactors at the nuclear power plant had taken a direct hit from a Russian strike and that the reactor was on fire. Shelling at Zaprisia stopped briefly. On 19th March, nine people were killed and 17 wounded in another round of shelling in the suburbs. The Russian invasion of the city forced many of its inhabitants to flee the war and destruction for safety. For those who remained, it's now time to adapt to a change of regime. Paradox is in том, it was uh, very difficult for uh, also the high-level uh, guys uh, to speak in, in uh, Ukrainian, and they made many mistakes. And also in uh, their documents, uh, they made there are, uh, were many mistakes uh, in Ukrainian. So. Uh, I think it will be something like relief uh, for everybody to use their native language. We are here at the Victory Square in Melitopol. The irony, the yellow and blue still stands, but the place now under Russian control. There was a pole right there with the Ukrainian flag, which no longer stands. And this Victory Square has a statue of Tara Shevchenko, who was a poet and a national hero for the Ukrainians. Today, this, you know, this, this center, the cultural center, the Tara Shevchenko Center, has been converted into a city uh, council and where humanitarian aid is being provided. There are people who are, if you see, uh, there are people who are there signing up to get aid. Uh, humanitarian aid and assistance while the city over here has not seen a uh, lot of damage because this is one of the first cities that was taken by the Russian forces from Crimea uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the people over here still are in the city about 20% we're told have left Melitopol but most of them are still here but this is also a divided house for school, it's possible to uh, choice to, to make a choice which language they use. It is not a part of the deal between Ukraine and Russia, but Russia certainly wants to control all the border towns between Ukraine and Russia and the sea regions of Ukraine, which includes Zaporizhia. And so, the blue and yellow could in all probability no longer be seen in Melitopol or Zaporizhia. With the journalist Satya Rautre, in Melitopol, Geeta Mohan for India Today. India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar said India is keeping an eye on the human rights situation in the United States of America, especially when it comes to Indian nationals and Indian interests. This after the US made a comment about human rights in India. And this isn't the only time that he actually schooled the United States. When a journalist asked the external affairs minister about India buying oil from Russia, he said Europe perhaps buys more oil and gas, more energy from Russia in an afternoon than India in a month. Clearly, India telling the world where we stand and where they need to sit down. India's external affairs minister is dropping one bombshell after another and he's been on a roll for the last few days. In the geopolitical spotlight for its neutral stand on the Russia-Ukraine war, India has once again schooled the West, exposing America's own hypocrisy in front of the entire world. The latest diplomatic knockout comes once again from India's External Affairs Minister, Dr. Subramaniam Jayashankar. 
The provocation was this comment from US Secretary of State Antony Blinken during the recent 2 plus 2 dialogue. We also share a commitment to our democratic values, such as protecting human rights. We regularly engage with our Indian partners on these shared values, and to that end, we're monitoring some recent concerning developments in India, including a rise in human rights abuses by some government, police, and prison officials. With the US commenting that it is monitoring concerning developments and the rise in human rights abuses in India, Dr. Jay Shankar minced no words to show the United States the mirror. We also take, uh, have views on other people's human rights situation, uh, including that of the United States. So we take up human rights uh, issues when they arise in this country, especially when they pertain to our community. And uh, in fact, we had a case yesterday. Yes. It's the first time that India has responded so openly on an American platform and on American soil. The minister also reminded the U.S. Secretary of State of the assault on two Sikh gentlemen in New York City during the visit. People are entitled to have views about us. But we are also equally entitled to have views about their views and about the interests and the lobbies and the vote banks which drive that. Uh, so uh, uh, whenever there is a discussion, I can tell you that uh, we will not uh, be reticent uh, about uh, speaking out. This isn't the first time a neutral, resurgent India has stood firm on its own diplomatic policy. Just a few days ago, Minister Jay Shankar, in his usual gentle manner, had this sharp reply when a Western journalist questioned him on India buying oil from Russia. If you are looking at energy purchases from Russia, I would suggest that your attention should be focused on Europe, which probably uh, we do buy some uh, uh, energy which is necessary for our energy security. But I suspect looking at the figures, probably uh, our total purchases for the month would be less than what Europe does in an afternoon. America has been trying everything it can to get India to budge under pressure including this seemingly callous and intemperate remark by U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor Dalip Singh. India has made it clear it will not buckle under any pressure and India's stand is clear, peace is paramount, a message reiterated by Prime Minister Modi in his interaction with U.S. President Biden on Monday night. I have Ukraine and Russia have talked to phone on the phone. मैंने न सिर्फ शांति की अपील की बल्कि मैंने राष्ट्रपति पुतिन को यूक्रेन के राष्ट्रपति के साथ सीधी बातचीत का सुझाव भी रखा इंडिया इज इनटू सॉल्यूशंस नॉट शैलो कंडेमनेशंस इंडिया इज फॉर वर्ल्ड पीस एंड इज नॉट हियर टू टेक ज्ञान फ्रॉम वेस्टर्न कंट्रीज इंडिया मेक्स इट अबंडेंटली क्लियर ऑन एवरी वर्ल्ड प्लेटफॉर्म नाउ that it will not give in to any pressure or empty criticism without giving it right back. Bureau Report, India Today. The Russian forces claim that they're completely in control of Mariupol, a claim that has been denied by the Ukrainian forces who insist that they continue to resist and they continue to fight. We bring you a ground report from Mariupol where thousands of people remain trapped as Russia and Ukraine, the forces continue to fight for control of this very crucial port city at the Sea of Azov.